no giving me suits. Y'all, yeah, it's your boy Sheik Looch, LOXD Block, Silverback Gorilla up in here, man. And Discretion TV, Valentino, number one, Tupac channel, streaming over 2 million viewers and listeners, man. That's crazy. Y'all rocking on over there. It feels so good. You know, like a week ago, I was locked down for 23 hours. Somebody coming by telling me to clean up my cell, get tickets for that, and, you know, in a small, tiny closet, and no hot water, and you got to eat this nasty food. And I was like, you know, all I kept in my mind was one day, I'll be back. And I plot and plan, and got so many plans. And my first plan was to do an album in two days, if I could, in two days. Well, now it's taking us a week, so we all right, we still there. After this, I wrote a movie while I was locked down, and uh, I'm going to put that out. Um, I'm going to be in What's it. What's the movie about? It's called Live to Tell. It's about... Um, you wrote the whole script, on you? I wrote the whole script. It's all finished. Mm -hmm. It's about um, this guy who's just coming of age. It starts out from when he's a child all the way to when he's, uh, you know, in his 40s or whatever, 30s. And, and he's finally understanding, like, what is life really about? It's not like men to society or boys to good or nothing like that. But um, it's about life. I think it's really about life. I, it's semi-autobiography. I put some of the shit about my life in there just to, like, um, keep it real. But And I put stuff that I heard when I was in there, you know, because I was in there with dudes that was never going to see the sunlight no more. Dudes that knocked out their own lawyer. I'm listening to this dude tell me he knocked out his own lawyer. He did not like, the, you know, the way it was going down. And he knocked his own lawyer. I said, well... You didn't think you was going to get out after that, did you? So you, when you were when you're locked down, did you, were you able to write then? Mm-hmm. So you wrote this movie while I wrote the movie, Let It Tell. You're going to make the movie on death row? I don't know where I'm going to make it. Probably, I want to, if it's possible at all. Death row get first haps, first mm -hmm. of all. But, um, did that. Um, you going to start? Yeah, I'm going to do something, man. Um, then the other movie things come up? Yeah, I began, I started writing two other ones. So the, this movie that you got work on, you're going to work on, you're going to do it? You think you might land it with Death Row or what? I believe so. I hope so. I got a lot of people talking to me about it. Have you got any other movie movie offers just for acting? Yeah, a lot of them. How about? We were down the street um, when it happened. We didn't know if we heard gunshots, so we didn't really know exactly what we heard. We heard a lot of screaming, um, a lot of cars screeching. Um, we were just hanging out, taking taking photos at the time. We ran up the street as cops were running past us, and uh, by the time we got here, they were already taking, um, which now I found out was Tupac into the uh, helicopter the way he had been shot. Turn who claimed that Tupac was yeah. airlifted out of there, uh -huh. but that wasn't true either. She must have been on one. Yeah, there, there, there's <laughs> a lot. There's a lot going on. The first thing we heard was, Suge Knight and Tupac are dead. That was the first thing we ever heard. And I was like, what the fuck? And we were just in awe. He was like, yeah, they just ambulance just came. They just airlifted Tupac out of here. Them niggas is dead. Hold me on the leg. He goes, yeah, if anything happens, if anything comes up, Richie would be the one running the whole day in the day out operation. <sighs> Man, I can't see it. Richie's dad told me that. Well, he goes, he said, Michael, if anything happens to Suge, that's what he told me. If anything happens to Suge, Richie would run the majority of the company. One thing Suge didn't do is he didn't blame any of it for Reggie. And trust me, the shit was all Reggie's fault. Yeah, it was. It was all Reggie's fault. It should have been blamed on Reggie. You know, I mean, it wasn't even something where you could debate it. Any any common sense tells you that the fault, just the fault was yours. You had been off for six weeks. Yeah. Every one of them decisions that got me, and me out of there, you in there, and everything else, all that came from Reggie's and he was screaming Machiavelli at the top of his lungs. That bodyguard that was pulled off his feelings car. about what could go wrong. And Pac's words were, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut out Machiavelli, and when I cut out Machiavelli, I'm the hell up out of here. You got your money, I don't want nothing else to do with death row, I'm out. That's how we left that day. There was all kinds of... Very upset. And they got to yell at each other back and forth. They confronted each other basically to a face-to-face. -face. I did slide in between them and said, hey, you know, you can't do this while I'm here or I am going to have to step out of the room. Normally, I am asked in every situation that I can remember while working with Death Row where there was altercations, fights, where some type of discipline was going to be passed out during Death Row, I'm usually asked to step outside the room. Uh, but on this occasion, 
I think Mr. Knight had me stay for the safety of Tupac. I mean, that's the reason I was there, because I think Mr. Knight, with me not being there, he would have put his hands on him. He was that upset. One, told not to carry any weapons to Club 662. Two, we were told not to have any weapons on us at any time while we were in Las Vegas. Reggie Wright asked me to ride with him to the meeting that we were having. It was about 12 noon. And we were going to uh, George Kalisa's office in Las Vegas. When we arrived there, there was 23 other security personnel for rightway security at this meeting, along with uh, the attorney and Reggie Wright. When we got there, they started going through the meeting and what the meeting was about. And one of the uh, main issues and the main points were we were not to carry our weapons. So that right away brought up the uh, issue of why not? The topic of discussion about the weapons was why not? Who are gonna carry weapons? Why are we not gonna carry weapons? We were told that we could not carry weapons and no one should have a weapon on it. He said it right out of his mouth and his girlfriend confirmed it. Who, Reggie? Yeah. What did he say? Say what you did. He said they had me dead. He said that they, uh, they, they, they said you, you told a lot of stuff. set and it was in the evening time because it was already night and I got this phone call from Yasmin Fula and she said hey Frank I'm coming down to a gridlock uh, don't you and Kevin leave because I need to talk to the two of you so you know probably 30 minutes later uh, she shows up and um, she goes hey she goes uh, there's some things going on over at the uh, death row office uh, Pac is called an audit on the death row office now, this was the first time I had ever heard anything about an audit, obviously, because she came down to tell us this uh, a story about, you know, the audit going on. And her, her main thing was that um, she wanted us to pay, like, a little bit more closer attention uh, to Pac, watch him a little bit closer because uh, she wasn't sure of the repercussions of this audit that was going to be going on because apparently hot, Pac was pretty hot over it. Fox's words were, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut out Machiavelli, and when I cut out Machiavelli, I'm the hell up out of here. You got your money, I don't want nothing else to do with death row, I'm out. That's how we left 
that day. Oh, maybe about three weeks later, my nephew gave me a call and say, uh, meet me at Edie Falls office, the lawyer's office, and praying two straps. So I get there, it's Shug, Reggie Sr., and uh, Sergeant Reynolds. They up there, and they gave us 60000 to say Landon, to say, testify, say Landon kicked the dude. So, so why why were they up there? The to protect Chug, I guess. That was his motherfucking hitters, I guess. I don't know. Fuck him though. He was standing there waiting and lay, waiting for somebody, and then Tupac shows up and they start exchanging words with his entourage and everybody else, and they start stomping and, and yelling and doing their silly things, but. It was odd that, I keep saying odd, but the whole thing is odd. Everything surrounding the case is odd. Orlando Anderson is leaning up at a wall watching people come out of the fight. And this is near the food court. And the, and the bank of elevators is where this happened. And then you walk to the um, lobby, through the casino a bit and then to the lobby. And um, it always struck me as, as, that whole thing struck me as odd. Um, and they let him go. He did not have a ticket to the fight. He did tell people at one point and told the police that he had a ticket, but he didn't have a ticket. He did not attend the fight. He's from Compton. He had no reason to be in Las Vegas. He, um, he told some people he came here to gamble. He had no reason, and that to me is you've, you've got a guy at the scene of the crime and you have no reason for him to be in Las Vegas. So why was Orlando Anderson in Las Vegas? Nobody has been able to answer that question, and I asked the police that as well. He did not attend the fight, so he wasn't here for the fight. And this is holding boxing match by Marion Suge Knight, the head of his label, Death Row Records. Police still have no leads. Prosecutors say Knight is seen kicking Orlando Anderson. And that act is the alleged probation violation. The video is evidence in Knight's probation revocation hearing, proof the DA's office says Knight took part in the beating of Anderson last September. He's on trial for what appeared to this court to be a kick. The atmosphere in which this kick took place, though, I don't think came forth to this court. And I think that should be considered in determining the severity of the punishment to be imposed on Mr. Knight. When I actually knew it was a rumble going on and that's when I started to break things up. You wanted to break up this fight if you will. Attempting to pull up the security guard and attempted to pull up Mr. Anderson. At Suge's hearing. I seen him pulling people up on me. That's all I, I see. Orlando testified on Suge's behalf. Why did he do that? Oh uh, he gave up sixty thousand dollars to say that uh, he didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And the proffered deal, when he did his original, you know, uh, statement to the police about this, you know, 15 years ago, that only covers what he says that day in that meeting. Mm -hmm. If he went on CNN that night and said the same story, they would be able to use that interview against him. So he, yeah. I think he knows full well he had to be careful what he said. So what do you expect to come next? Um, obviously, Keefe D had to know something might be coming since a search warrant was executed on his home. Yes. Here at the House of Blues in 1996, an off-duty Santa Monica cop working security confiscated a 40 caliber Glock handgun similar to this from a member of Tupac Shakur's entourage. About two weeks after that, I was contacted by Reggie to go over to Santa Monica Police Department to pick up this firearm. Hackey says he first showed the handgun to his FBI handlers and then turned it over to Reggie Wright Jr. A month later in Las Vegas, Investigators say it was a 40 Glock handgun that killed Tupac Shakur. Nope. Hackey There's believes the murder logic. weapon was the same gun he gave Reggie Wright Jr. I believe it is. And here's why. Hackey says he asked Wright about the 40 Glock. He stated once I gave him that firearm, he gave it back to his daddy, who at the time was a lieutenant with Compton Police over the uh, gang division. He stated his daddy booked that firearm in the property, which, you know, is really and truly far-fetched. And Hackey that says time, six months after Tupac's was, uh, murder, Compton. he had another conversation with Reggie Jr. about the missing handgun. Now, mind it you, didn't go well. After that, Reggie told me, you know, hey, it ain't given time. You know, I have the money, I have the people, I can have you killed, it ain't given time. Hackey says he told his FBI handlers 
and according to these transcripts obtained by Fox 11, also told LAPD detectives a decade ago that Wright had threatened, I can have you killed at any given time. Many people believe Orlando Anderson was the killer of Tupac Shakur. But we've managed to set up a meeting with Orlando's brother and one of his cousins. Word on the street was Orlando was bragging about it. Why would you brag about something and you know you can get told on and go to jail for life? Six o'clock, Tupac arrives in Vegas, heads to the Tyson fight. In the wake of the Tyson fight, Tupac, Suge, and the rest of the death row entourage had an encounter with Southside Crip member Orlando Anderson. The man in the midst. The chain snatcher. Tupac has been conscripted into a war that he didn't begin. Before he knows it, he's uh, wailing on this young man. You know, the East Coast, West Coast beef going on. Like, are right. out there? My brother couldn't have did that. How can he? He was up. They whooped my brother out, and they tried to kill my brother out there. A white Cadillac came up, and an arm came out and began shooting. Okay, he, he, he got jumped, and there was a motive for them. It's an easy way out. That man can't tell you if he did it or not. I mean, you know, I want just want to, you know, I just want to tell everyone that, you know, what I mean, I didn't, um, you know, I didn't do it. And I, you know, so I feel sorry for him. You know, what I'm saying his fans and his, you know, his family.